Good evening, dear friends, and welcome to our weekly online event, Diving into Dhamma, live Q&A with Bhante Sumita. I'm your host, Delani Gunasekara, and I'm truly excited to be here with all of you today. Every Friday at 6 p.m. PST and Saturday 6.30 a.m. IST, we gather here on the Dhamma USA YouTube channel to engage in enlightening discussions and Q&A sessions with the esteemed Bhante Sumita. So please mark your calendars for every Friday at 6 p.m. PST and be ready to tune in to these insightful sessions with Bhante Sumita, who holds a PhD in the subject matter, because the wisdom that he imparts is a guiding light for us all on our spiritual journey. So without further ado, let's invite Bhante to the studio. Teruan Saranai. Teruan Saranai, how are you? Good. Okay. Uh, so we just had a uh, winter break, I think, um, in your school, right? Yeah. You must be very happy now. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Any plans for the upcoming New Year or how to spend your vacation? Sleep. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> All right. So what do you get today? I have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, some are from, my, from me and some are from my friends as well. Mm. So I will start with one of my own and we can go on from there. Um, so we have the first question. Um, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha explains to Ananda, dwell with yourself as an island, with yourself as refuge and so on and so forth, dwell with the Dhamma has refuge. So I was wondering if you could go more in detail about what the Buddha meant here. Ah, so this is Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Diga Nikaya 16. In Diga Nikaya, there are 32 suttas and long suttas. Venerable Ananda was the personal attendant of the Buddha who was taking care of uh, Venerable Ananda and his disciples were taking care of the Diganikaya, long discourses. And this Sutta Mahaparinibbana Sutta is a very wonderful, a vivid picture of the Buddha's last um, few days. His life story uh, is explained here. It's really well documented, um, long discourse. And in this Sutta, um, what you mentioned here is about the um, like uh, refuge unto yourself. And the Buddha said here, Tasma tiha ananda atta deepa viharata atta sarana ananya sarana dhamma deepa dhamma sarana ananya sarana. So, therefore, ananda be islands unto yourself, refuge unto yourself, seeking no external refuge with the Dhamma as your island, the Dhamma as your refuge, seeking no other refuge. So it's a very powerful statement actually, how, how you, can, you, you can give authority to yourself. You can have self-confidence within yourself and you trust yourself, you know, you are the owner of your own karma and you are the boss. So you can dictate, you can do whatever you want and you will be rewarded or punished accordingly, right? So that is why Atta, atta Deepa Viharata, Deepa can be lamp or an island. If you say it as a lamp, you can enlighten yourself. You can kindle your own lamp. And when you are in the darkness, you can kindle yourself and you can enlighten yourself. You have the authority. Remember that. That's a very, very powerful um, empowerment that the Buddha gave to us. And um, 
So it's up to you. Atta Deepa Viharata. You need to create your own island or you need to um, kindle your own lamp and dis to dispel the darkness to come out of this sansaric misery. And then, so you can be refuge unto yourself. Atta Sarana. Ananya Sarana means there is no use uh, going for external refuges. But look into yourself, like the insight meditation, for example, Vipassana Bhavana. That means you have the, the Four Noble Truths. You have the, the, the truth of suffering within you. You have the root cause of suffering within you. You have the cessation of suffering within you. You have the path leading to the cessation of suffering within you, not outside. This is very interesting. The Buddha said, Akhataro Tathagata, the Buddhas have shown us the path. He has given he us instructions how to walk in the path. And it is up to us to walk along. And he can he can't really drag it us. We have to walk. Every single step belongs to us. Our own independent uh, authoritative uh, uh, walk, progress. So Atta Sarana is that. Ananya Sarana uh, is you can excessively or blindly believe or have faith in others. And so do not expect the other external force will take you to the Nibbana. It's not going to happen. You have to make your own island. You have to make your own lamp. You have to really uh, work on your own. That is the idea. And then Dhamma will be the, the island. Okay. Dhamma will be your refuge. And seeking no other refuge. Dhamma is the teaching. The teaching can be your lamp. Teaching can be your refuge. You can use the teaching as a torch, as light, and you can work along that. So that is the idea. So here, exceptionally lucid and pointing to ultimate liberation. These were some of the last words spoken by the Buddha on his deathbed. So it's it's very interesting how the Buddha was giving us uh, that, you know, authority when he passed away. His um, advice was very profound. I hope um, it was helpful. Very much. Um, I did not know about this. So when I was first reading about it, I was very interested in knowing what the meaning of it was. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, if you want, you can move on to our next question. So, um, so in the same sutta, the Buddha also discusses about the Dharma mirror. Um, could you maybe tell us more about what this is and maybe where we can find it? If you want to Dharma mirror, I think so. It could probably, uh, is related to this book. This is um, called Visuddhi Magga, Path of Purification. It is a, uh, by Badanta Acharya Buddha Gosa and also Bhikkhu Jnanamoli has translated. So in Visuddhi Magga, I remember uh, probably in Abhi, Abhidhammata Sangha or um, some other uh, places, you can also find this idea like um, um so you go to the mirror okay you go to the mirror and you see someone in the mirror right is mm -hmm. that you in the mirror yeah what do you think when you stand in front of the mirror who is in the mirror myself hmm? myself yourself then who are you then <laughs> I don't know, ghost? Ghost? <laughs> that doesn't make sense if you say ghost. <laughs> so that's the thing. You see, like the that is the projection. That is the, the mental projection that we have. So it is nacha so, nacha anyo. It, 
if it is you then who are you if it is not you then what is it <laughs> right so and so it is not somebody else also right if mm. dulani is standing in front of the mirror you can see the reflection it should be dulani so if you say it is dulani then who is standing here and if you say no then who is it who is that it cannot be someone else also mm. right so that's very interesting question um yeah hair splitting argument so dharma can be a mirror to us in so many ways you know i think when we literally go in front of the mirror you can see yourself and you can see your reflection and you can see some uh, blind spot we need to see our blind spots there that's a really important thing and mm-hmm. when you see your blind spots maybe your gray hair maybe your wrinkles maybe some of those things that you have so most of the time what we do is we try to hide it we try to camouflage it right mm-hmm. and here when you think this the the mirror is a dharma, dharma mirror you can see the nature of change you can see the impermanence you can see the real you don't worry when you see those things we don't worry when you when you see you are growing it's okay you know so you accept it and then it also reminds us i'm not going to live forever and the my body is subject to change impermanence so what should i do i should do be- i should do better i should do well right i should be well i should be good and do good mm-hmm. and i should purify my mind that's the the idea so mind is the reflection in your body so when you see your body you can also see some of the reflections in your own mind let's say like you are upset you are aggressive you are sad you are depressed and then you can see yourself in the mirror and you can see there is a change right there is a change uh, in your reflection so dharma uh, can be a mirror to us in many many different ways the buddha said take the dharma as your teacher so these teachings when you see you can of always take it as a teaching to yourself yeah i just actually focus on one area but this is actually a massive topic we can uh, speak more but i hope for now um hope it gives you some idea yeah it actually does um i think yeah you're right this this topic is like more deeper and i think we can say that for maybe a future dhamma talk maybe but um Yeah, this is actually very interesting as well, just like the other topic that I asked you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have two more follow-up questions and all in the same sutta, so hope that's not that's okay. Um, so another one is uh before the Buddha decided to enter Parinirvana within Three months. Why did Mara persuade the Buddha to attain Parinirvana soon? I think Mara's duty is <laughs> to prevent all good things happening. You know, he didn't want him to become Buddha. Remember, he was he was fighting it out from the very beginning. So mm-hmm. ever since he never stopped. He was very uh, committed to his own mission. so mara's mission was to stop all good things happening and the buddha's mission was to make sure that his dharma his teaching is well established and his disciples are learned enough trained enough to you know maintain the buddha sasana at least for a while mm-hmm. so it is not only actually 3 months before he was trying all all the time 
uh, when he was practicing meditation, uh, he he even sent his three daughters, right? Tanha, mm. Rati, and Raga. These are the three siblings of the same same family. Tanha craving, Rati is also like attachment or mm. lust, and then Raga also. You see, like they are all sensual lust, attachment, desires. Uh, craving, these are all parts of the same family, three different forms of the same uh, defilement. And they are not literally human or other figures, but the, the mental concomitants, consciousness, like the, 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 the chetasikas that we have, the, the thoughts that we have. And so in that way, you can see how the Buddha was fighting out the, the internal thoughts, temptations, right? And then it is said, Mara came um, along with uh, 10 senas, 10 armies. So these are also not like personal armies, again. These are not personal armies. These are like um, Kama Te Patama Sena, the first army was the karma, sensual desires. <laughs> so there were other, um, all the, the mental defilements that we have, thoughts and temptations, they are the different armies of the Mara. So when we do good things in our life, you might see there will be very, very, difficult, challenging situations. Let's say like you are trying to meditate. At the beginning, maybe you find it very fine, peaceful, but even then you can see how difficult it is to, for you to establish your concentration, your mindfulness, always distracting, like maybe sloth and topa, like thinamidha, you feel like lethargic, you don't feel like, you know, no, no courage, no strength. And so you always are distracted. Attention is deviated. All these things happen when you try to meditate. So we can say like these are the Maras. These are actually done by the Maras. But then again, um, we can succumb to those things. We have to make some effort. We have to also uh, focus on our own sealer. And when there are some loopholes in your sealer, these things can happen more. This Mara impact will be more stronger. And when you practice yourself, when you are more focused, determined, make effort and unhesitating um, effort, effort and you do, and when you become more diligent and mindful, and then even the Mara cannot pierce through, especially your code of conduct, your sealer, when that morality side is stronger, your precepts are more better uh, maintained, the Mara can't really um, impact you, can't really pierce through. That is the idea. Okay. So it is said like um, Buddha already decided, he knows uh, his lifespan, he knows when the when even the Mara was trying to convince him that it is now you have attained Buddhahood, you can uh, go to Parinibbana. He said immediately after enlightenment also, you know. <laughs> and then the Buddha said, No, no, I I have I'm not done yet. <laughs> I I have to train my disciples. And then when he did that, the Mara came again, and now you are trained. You have trained enough. You have very well trained uh, disciples. Now you can do it, you know. So he was always trying to remind the Buddha. Uh, Buddha knew exactly when to uh, pass away, and then um, although he was also doing it like traditionally, but the Buddha knew his uh, mission, and um, so he decided when the right time comes, he decided to go for parinibbana. And um, if he lived like thousands of years, maybe then today, we probably um, will see him still <laughs> live. And it will also be very weird to see like someone who lives like thousands of years and <laughs> where are the other people just live maybe 
80, 90, 100 years. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make sense to, right? You see, like the Buddha also have to um, follow his own teaching, um, his own theory, right? Impermanence. Everything is subject to change, subject to impermanence. So there are certain, I think maybe um, later if you have more follow-up questions, I can answer. But for now, um, this is the idea. Like um, it is the Buddha who decides to um, go for Parinibbana, but Mara will always try to pierce through. The idea here is that whenever we do good things, we have to be more mindful. We have to make really good effort. We have to be more determined and also focus on our own sealer precepts. And that way, even the Mara can't really pierce through. That is the idea. Okay, so it's a constant reminder to us that Mm -hmm. there is someone who is trying to distract you, who is trying to divert your attention in all your good things. For example, if you are a student, you will see hundreds and thousands of reasons, excuses not to study, right? <laughs> you see, like it's it's like the Mara who is not helping you. It's like the Mara who is trying to divert your attention. But if you do some bad things, there will be so many friends who help you. <laughs> you know, it's easy to do good, bad things. It's so difficult to do uh, good things. So that is the idea here. I think we need to take it uh, literally. Mm-hmm. But as a traditional Buddhist, you also need to think there are certain um, certain things that we need to accept that uh, Buddha passed away um, at the uh, invitation by the Mara. Um, but I, I think that is the idea. Like the Buddha already knew uh, how long he was going to survive. He already mm-hmm. had decided that. So 80 years um, was long enough for, a, uh, for an average human to be strong enough to survive and, um, you know, teach until that time. After that, you are, you are becoming physically and mentally not so stronger. You become weaker. So I think by the time 80, is a good time. Even today, 80 is a good time. <laughs> Maybe after 80, a lot of people, there are hardly anyone actually um, who can be strong enough to survive. Yeah. I think in this case, martyrs like has people believe in the angel and the devil. So in this case, he's like, he's like the devil. The devil is always trying to um, persuade others to like not do what they want to do or just you know always trying to put them to the opposite side so yeah that is the negativity right the positivity and negativity the clash between the two most of the time the negativity wins (laughs) but if we are more determined our positivity can win too Uh, if we succumb to negativity our um, you know uh, always like downsides, always lazy and always procrastinating things, then that means they are signs of you succumbing to that negativity. But if you make effort, if you work hard, if you are diligent, if you are more mindful, focus, that means you fight against that negativity. Neg- that is the Mara. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that answer. I think it will helped me a lot and I think other people who wanted to know about this in the future can also benefit from this answer as well. Uh, so I have one more follow-up question um, from Mahaparinibbana Sutta and this is when Ananda requested the Buddha to lay for his final rest in one of the six major cities in India but the question is why did Buddha specifically chose or choose the rest in Kushinara. I think you must have heard like when the Bodhisattva came, descended from heaven, Tavatins realm, um, he, it is said, traditionally it is said he already was searching for the right time. 
um, it is said uh, pancha maha vilokana in singhala we call pas maha balum five mm-hmm. kinds of um, uh, future um, like conditions first thing is kala if is that the suitable time for uh, bodhisattva to descend and you know um, become a buddha kala and then there's a deeper uh, the the right country and the right uh, location um, and then um, uh, kula uh, it is the the right family and then um, um, uh, mother even the the parents he was looking for uh, the mother it is said traditionally uh, we also have to give priority to our traditional teaching so traditionally it is said when the bodhisattva decides he he times it before descending before landing on this earth he he times it like his mother's lifespan should be just 10 uh, seven days after his birth so after seven, uh, his birth the mother will live only seven days and that so that is the timing and when all these things are accomplished he would descend and then he would uh, attain buddhahood so that is um, i mean uh, specifically when we talk about that that is the idea so over here with the kusinara the place where he passed away uh, was also just like that it's not a random decision it's already a place where the buddha uh, passed away like the buddha gaya uh, it is also not the only place by this buddha uh, but maybe in the uh, it is said the past buddhas too uh probably some of the other buddhas also have um attained the, the nibbana parinibbana or the enlightenment uh enlightenment in the buddha gaya parinibbana in the kosinara so certain areas already have been uh, destined they have kind of predetermined to go there and um, one more thing i think more important in this question is the fact that he was born under a tree and he was enlightened under a tree mm-hmm. and he passed away under a tree mm-hmm. i think that is more such a wonderful um wonderful fact that um he belonged to the world he he belonged to the nature and he that is why the buddha or buddhism um for that matter is followed by everyone in the world different mm-hmm. cultures different countries different languages different communities they all follow the teachings of the buddha because he taught a dhamma that was universal and it can be applied even today with the very same effect and his teaching belong to the the nature his law of nature um his dharma is the law of nature and uh, that is why i think uh, this idea should be um more applicable i think in this case um even though there were other cities um so this is where he um he found more comfortable in um attaining parinibbana mm. yeah I, for, i forgot that i only asked that question about the five uh predetermined things that a bodhisattva has to do before they descend to the human realm and also something else you mentioned about how buddha was born under a tree and attained enlightenment under a tree and passed away under a tree um it's interesting because he was born under a sal tree in lubini sal park and he passed away under two sal trees in kusinara and he was enlightened under bodhi tree mm-hmm. in buddha gaya yeah all trees <laughs> okay so tree belongs to the world nature 
Mm. Very interesting. I think these things we don't really think about until we actually really focus on to them. So mm-hmm. we're always learning something. Okay, uh, our next question. Um, actually, before we move on to this question, um, I did want to say something for the previous question. Um, I think I was listening to a Dhamma talk from another Ajahn, I think, and he had mentioned uh, that the Mahaparinibbana Sutta is technically not a discourse, even though it's in the Diginikaya, and it's more of a personal narrative written by someone else who was with the Buddha at the time. Is that true? You say like, you could say to many sutta, like whenever you hear like, e wang me sutang, you could say it's not the Buddha's words. <laughs> mm-hmm. E wang me sutang means thus have I heard. So who, who heard? Venerable Ananda heard. Right? And there are suttas. There are suttas like Buddha Bhasita, Savaka Bhasita, and uh, there are some suttas. We can also read some of those uh, suttas where um, the devas were involved and maybe some um, yakas were involved, some uh, petas were involved, discussions, and uh, you know, venerable. Ananda, Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahakasapa, Venerable Kachayana, all those um, disciples were also involved. So, mm-hmm. but they should match the Dhamma and the Vinaya. That is the idea. And that is why they were all compiled in the first uh, Buddhist council. And later, even the Abhidhamma was formed uh, by the time. The third Buddhist council uh, was done like two, 200 years later, uh, the passing away of the Buddha, the third Buddhist council. And that time the uh, Abhidhamma um, Pitaka was complete. So not necessarily every word of, the, of those things are by the Buddha himself, but they were compiled in such a way that they were following a certain pattern of the teaching of the Buddha. That mm-hmm. is the idea. Good to okay. Know. Um, okay, so my next question is uh, related to the fourth precept that almost every Buddhist should know. Um, and my question is, how can we also refrain from using harsh speech when we're surrounded in an environment that uses such form of speech? <laughs> That is exactly why we need to practice. Like even if you um, stay live in such a world where uh, lots and lots of harsh words and lots and lots of uh, distractive thoughts and words are uttered, um, then you should stand tall. You should be more mindful. And that is a better fertile ground for you to practice yourself. If everything is good, then I think there is nothing for, like no challenge for you, right? <laughs> Imagine like everyone, like the the two parrots, one parrot fell into the the hands of the, the ascetics and the other parrot fell into the hands of the, the robbers, thieves. And you see how they have changed. They are, do you know that story? Um, there is a beautiful story like how to, um, when a tree fell down, one um, there were two parrots, little ones, and one parrot was taken care of by um, some ascetics, like monks. Mm-hmm. And the other parrot was taken care of by the, the thieves. And so they were two worlds apart, although they were born together and they were like their surrounding was different so the the parrot with the ascetics was speaking very nice words beautiful compassionate and talking about the dhamma like you know the parrots can speak and they can um, mimic humans and so the one who followed the thieves 
were very rough and tough, very rugged and uh, very um, distracting uh, thoughts were there. Like when the, that parrot was speaking, um, that parrot was speaking really rough and tough language. <laughs> Uh, so, I think a, a practitioner finds it uh, a useful um, platform for him or her to practice or testify his or her own uh, practice, Dhamma. So, that is the idea. Like when you have a lot of people around, when they talk all the wrong words or all the wrong things, you need to know, you, you should be smart, you should be skillful enough to recognize whether you are going to follow up those things, those people or not. Mm. So you really can do it. Um, if you do it, uh, there will be no end to, like, there should be someone out of that lot to come out victoriously and bravely, you know, and change that system. I think lots and lots of us are trend followers. Only few of us are trend setters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the Buddha was only one person in the world for the last 2,500 years, and he was the trend setter. He was teaching against many discriminations in the society. He was fighting against the the caste problem, he was fighting against the inhumanity among the humans, and he would he would he was fighting against those blindfolded people who were practicing things um, blindly, and then he opened their eyes. He was very um, he made a valiant effort uh, to you know as a rebellion you can say a rebel against all those uh, odds in that society. He was fighting against. Um, he, he gave them a path. He showed them a path. And he taught them such a wonderful teaching. And that can be applied eternally, everlasting, even today. Mm -hmm. he, he taught, the, the Dharma he taught can be applied even today such modern ideas are still there. Like today people talk, still people talk about the uh, freedom of living, freedom of speech, right? Mm -hmm. Buddha talk about freedom of thought. <laughs> such modern, ultra modern ideas he had, even those days. And when everyone was succumbed to the caste um, categories, he said, um, what is, uh, who is a vassala, who is a downcast, not by birth, but by action. And he gave freedom to people, like in the Kalama Sutta. Those are tremendously powerful suttas, teachings by the Buddha. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to know, like, um, when other people, are, most of the, the vast majority of the people would do many things wrong, but it is only a handful of people who would come against that. Lots and lots of people would swim downstream. Only very few valiant or brave people would run, um, swim um, against the current. Mm -hmm. The Buddha was one like that. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mainly ask this question because, at least in society right now, we are, uh, you we're surrounded by many people who use a lot of hard speech, and sometimes it can impact people around them too to also use that hard speech. But you're right, only very few go against that trend following. <laughs> yeah, I personally don't use hard speech, but I've seen many people around me do so yeah. try to be more respectful and try to you have to be mindful all the time actually um, even if the other people use them you don't have to do that you know you know how, how harsh 
it is, how hurtful it becomes. Um, and also you yourself become polluted when you do that. And later it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it's even more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because you would use these things everywhere. Yeah. So refrain from such uh, false speech, harsh speech, and, um, you know, um, um, gossips and uh, frivolous speech, mm -hmm. slandering, all these things we have to be careful about. That's part of the sealer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, our next question is pretty long, so it will be shown two times. Uh, in the eras of previous Buddhas, the lifespan was approximately 80,000 years. However, in Gautama Buddha's era, the lifespan has decreased to 80 years. So, and in consideration, the other realms also have a consistent number of years of lifespans, for example, Deva realms. So, what is the causes for the decrease of years for lifespan in the human realm? Again, um, from time to time, our lifespan uh, changes human uh, lifespan changes. Um, maybe in the course of uh, human evolution, life can change. And um, so due to many reasons, our life can be, can be shortened. Uh, uh, in, in Buddhism, it is said, uh, when you practice Dhamma, when you follow the precepts, your life can, lifespan can improve. Why do I say that? Because first precept is Panati Pata Veramani Sikha Padan Samadhi Ami. Um, I undertake the precept to observe um, the the I um, observe or refrain from killing living beings. So when you don't kill others, um, you are giving life to others. You respect others life what happens in return when you respect others what do you think others will not respect you they, also they will also respect you right hmm. even the animals if you practice loving kindness even the animals can feel it they will also respect you even those harsh animals very rugged animals very violent animals can also feel the power of loving kindness. So loving kindness is a really powerful teaching and that is exactly why we need to practice this, um, these things. And um, unfortunately, lots and lots of humans and uh, even human leaders, community leaders, religious leaders and other political leaders you know what they do is they um, they go against okay, they break the sealer they don't follow the sealer they are not sincere and honest and so they um, many people hurt others harm others and that actually denies our lifespan no matter how much we try you know with this ultra modern technology whatever we have we still can't live today more than 100 years. Hardly anyone can live that much. You see, with the help of all the vitamins, all the exercise machines, all the, uh, the technology that you have, you still can live 200 years, right? We can live. So, um, so it's part of our overall um, practice like being nice and being kind, being generous. All these things uh, should be practiced by everyone overall. Then, then our lifespan can improve. You see, we become more organic. We become, we don't um, actually pollute the, uh, the environment. Um, we take care of the, the environment. Uh, we also respect other people, other property, other families. We become truthful and we don't take uh, uh, drinks and drugs that cause intoxication or heedlessness. Imagine if you do that, 
the world would be a beautiful place right but do we see that today we don't see that we see that this the uh, degradation of the humanity all the time we see what's happening in the world for no reason sometimes all the dirty political reasons so unfortunate we see uh, like lots and lots of businesses happening and that is just for money not for humanitarian help a lot of people have money but they don't invest them for the sake of humanity they do it for their own ulterior motives and people earn money easy money through drugs through all kind of pharmaceuticals we have most of them are not human friendly more not nature friendly not sentient being friendly right mm-hmm. now we can see how we when we deny ourselves uh, of the privilege that we have to live together then um, we can actually um, shorten ourselves our own life span so the buddha lived a um, short span of life because this time around this uh, era around um, is um, is meant for that it is said slowly slowly it is said like the first it was just like 10 years or something mm-hmm. okay so people lived like 10 years and you do everything within that 10 years and then slowly it increased and it will increase it is said it is also like a, like an evolution and it will increase when people keep practicing the dhamma practicing sila uh, practicing precept become more human become more nature friendly and then um, life span can improve too so there are some uh, contributory factors to um, overall contributory factors to Uh, the improvement of life span and one day it will happen and then the life span also can improve mm. okay yeah thank you uh so i think we're all, we're good on time so we have two more questions left and they're from my friend um shall we take them yes okay So uh, my friend is asking um how can we convince the gen z generation to believe in buddhist teachings Yeah this <laughs> gen z thing i heard first time i think i know like gen next <laughs> so gen z is like the present generation I'm assuming i don't even know <laughs> Okay so yeah i think um if you think uh, like that so It, the how to how do they believe in buddhist teaching i think they need to open their eyes like can anyone argue against the the power of loving kindness if you say um don't harm others don't hurt others can someone uh, argue against such such philosophy such an ideology such a strong foundation for for the world like every sentient being is respected right and here you are not talking about one religious group you are not talking about one country or one culture or one language you are talking about no, you are not talking about only humans you are talking about every sentient beings all the animals all the heavenly beings all the 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 sentient beings in the hell realms they are all included all inclusive all sentient beings when you say we should cultivate we should develop loving kindness metta we could we should respect all of them can someone argue against that so i think that itself is a powerful powerful statement like we buddhists should not worry about what the others think but we should practice this thing in our own life when you and i practice people will observe us and they will see like how we are being benefited by that and 
you don't have to convince them they will see for themselves and uh, that's what we need to do be kind and do good you know be nice and wise i would say be nice in the same you have to be simple you have to be humble you have to be kind you have to be compassionate you have to be generous be wise means you have to be smart and skillful in selecting the right path what to do and what not to do you need to identify that and then you should be able to live your life peacefully comfortable comfortably with good health and you you can be a walking uh walking lamp um to the darkness you can be a torch bearer so the others can see the light others can also be benefited you have to do like that and that way i think um we whosoever how if someone has any respect for buddhism if someone is supposed to be uh, you know calling himself or herself as a buddhist you need to practice good things in your life teachings in your life and then people will see you and let the world know that way and we don't need to go after people okay come on follow us no the buddha said um ehi pasika come and see the buddha didn't say come and embrace come and see if you if you like you can follow it you know so i think the teachings of the buddha itself is good enough i think i i would say like just um, just a summary you know um uh, not to do all the evils and to do all the good things and to purify the mind this is the teaching of all the buddhas you remember that sabba papas akaranam kusalas upasampada sacitta paryodapanam etam buddha anusasana and that is the very quintessential essence of buddhist teachings and if you practice five precepts alone respect others life respect others property property respect others family and be honest and truthful and do not take drinks and drugs that cause intoxication or heedless heedlessness five precepts apply that practice that in your day to day life and how you can impact the rest of the world i hope if we those people who call themselves buddhists if they practice these things i think gen c generation will start to believe in buddhist teachings mm. it's up to us now <laughs> yeah. i uh, i asked my friend to watch this or at least later on so um if he watches this he'll get his answer so i should yeah answer. hopefully <laughs> yeah um he has another question i think more related to uh business side i think um what he's asking how can we apply buddhist teachings to make money and manage our lives financially yeah i think uh as i mentioned in the five precepts the second precept is um adinna dana veramani sikkha padam samadhiyami um uh i undertake the precept to observe uh, to abstain from taking things not given mm-hmm. so you respect others property that way your property will be also in uh, secured you have better insurance when you respect other people's property and mm-hmm. that's a really nice thing because you respect others property well, that is the 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 number one thing and then uh, the buddha has uh, given many uh, wonderful teachings like digalo or the sutta he talks about um, not to be lazy like there are some people who is uh, there are some people who are always lazy they try to procrastinate things right 
and sometimes they say oh i am so uh, it is so cold today so i want to procrastinate oh it is so hot today i want to procrastinate it is too early it is too late i am so hungry i am full you know so you try to find a lame excuse to procrastinate and that's not going to help you to become you know accomplished um your um your uh, teachings i mean your goals so it's important you need to work hard diligently mm -hmm. and the i think it will be very important for those people who want to think of financially financially establishing the buddha said um, when let's say like you have hundred dollars as an income mm -hmm. and then you need to keep um one fourth of that um as a, um for your day-to-day -day expenses don't expend uh, spend everything <laughs> you know and then uh, two thirds uh, sorry um half of it like um two parts that means fifty dollars. Okay, twenty-five dollars you use for daily expenses, and fifty dollars you need to invest uh, in your business. Okay, maybe if you are doing some business, you need to you don't invest everything, but only fifty dollars. So fifty dollars already twenty-five dollars for your daily other things, and then fifty dollars for your investment. And then another twenty-five dollars you need to keep for future. Mm -hmm. You need to keep for future, in just in case you need something. You know, some certainly um, un unexpected things happen, right? Sometimes um, um, economy collapse and you know global uh, pandemic or whatever happens, and then you have that money that you have saved uh, for your own future. Uh, so you you should be very smart in doing that. You should uh, also work hard, uh, diligently, and uh, also the Buddha said, uh, I would say, uh, five um, things that you should not do. Five professions. Okay, it is said, satta vanijya, satha vanijya, visa vanijya, majja vanijya, and mansa vanijya. Satta vanijya means animal husbandry is not promoted in Buddhism. So animal husbandry means you are actually torturing other animals. So Buddhism does not um, encourage that. Sattha Vanijya, again, the, the weapon business. These are easy money, you know. Weapon business, easy money. And you can earn lots and lots of money. But then again, that can kill other people that can also destroy our nature. So Buddhism does not encourage sattva vanijya, weapon business. Visa vanijya, poison business. What is the poison business? Maybe like, fert uh, like um, chemical fertilizers. Mm. Uh, you, can, you can see those beautiful, uh, bigger in size and very nicely packed things in the market and but you also can see like processed foods um they are mostly uh, visa vanijya you know they are not helping our humans our humans get mysterious diseases when they consume it and no matter how much advanced is our uh, medicine today technology everything today but people get sick all the time they get cancer like um, as never before we see cancer patients we see like um, many many uh, pandemics people also it is said i don't know if it is true or not but it is said like people can also create viruses or create um, health risks or uh, some diseases uh, to harm our humans that's so scary, right? <laughs> All these things are um, not encouraged in Buddhism. Visavanijya, Majjavanijya is alcohol, intoxicating drinks and drugs. Complete no-no in Buddhism. 
so that also is harmful to also detrimental to our health and also to our economy you you don't have you you're not physically strong enough to survive when you are like intoxicated with drinks and drugs we see how families have collapsed we see how they they have gone bankrupt just because of that i think it should be also included the gambling and the other things and then the the mansavanija human trafficking these are easy money but not encouraged in buddhism so if you want to establish yourself financially follow some of these steps and do the right thing with the right view and samma ajiva is right livelihood that is encouraged in buddhism thank you very much i think my friend will definitely find these his questions very helpful um so i think we have reached um one hour um okay. and yeah we don't have any more questions so it's good um so i think um we are coming close to the end of our session with uh we answered all of our questions actually so that's very good to hear um but first of all i would like to thank one day for your insightful and elaborate answers to all of her questions we appreciate your valuable time to come on here and share your wisdom and knowledge with our friends from all over the globe online and for all of our viewers watching please make sure you're following us on the USA socials youtube and facebook to be updated with the latest notifications and since it's almost the end of 20 23 and we're nearing to the new year of 2024 we will be taking a little break but we look forward to seeing you all in the new year with another episode of diving into dhamma with bhante suita and thank you again for all of our viewers to, for joining us today and on behalf of the audience may we ask bhante to deliver some blessings for us Okay as the the new year is coming up and the old year is going to be over I would like to in our blessings upon all of you to be well happy healthy safe with the blessings of the noble triple gem may you and your family members friends and relatives teachers and elders everyone in your family everyone in your community everyone in your neighborhood everyone in your country and everyone in the world may all sentient beings including devas brahmas uh, in the heavenly realms and also the other animals and other uh, hungry ghosts and all the other sentient beings also be blessed by the noble triple gem may you all be well happy healthy safe wherever you are may no harm come to you from water fire air may you always be safe and protected wherever you are May you be able to live your life peacefully, comfortably with good health. May all of us and all of you and all sentient beings be able to attain the absolute peace and happiness, the final liberation, the nibbana at the end of our samsara. Thinking thus, please keep your palms together close to your heart and say three times, Sadhu. साधु साधु अभिवादन सीलिस निचं वधा पचायनो चत्तारो धम्मा वढ़ंते आयुवंगनो सुकंग बलं आयुरारोग्य संपत्ति सग्ग संपत्ति मेवचे अतो निबान संपत्ति इमिनाते समिज्जतु साधु 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 थैंक यू एंड यू विल ऑल सी यू इन द न्यू ईयर